Uh, this video is walking you guys through um, just a key, couple key elements that you should be really examining when you're analyzing a piece of literature. Um, setting, point of view, plot, conflict, and symbolism. And there's just a few items I wanted to highlight for you guys when it comes to not only how to identify these elements, but analyze them within the context of literary analysis. So the setting is obviously incredibly important. The setting is not just where the story takes place, although obviously that is what the setting, you know, the purpose of a setting. The setting can actually inform a lot of the narrative. So it can inform the characters, the tone, the plot, the conflict, um, etc. Uh, for example, if you had a Wizard of Oz and you put it in, I don't know, um, uh, feudal Japan, it wouldn't make much sense, right? So it can the the characters are are driven by certain things within the setting. Um, the tone of the piece is driven by the setting. So, for example. Mordor in Middle-earth is a very different setting than the Shire and because it's Mordor and the characters you know Frodo and Sam um, are, are there um, trying to return the ring it, it does set the tone of the space right it makes it feel um, foreboding it makes it feel ominous oppressive um, frightening um, it also, like I said, drives the character's motivations, which in turn drives their development as characters. So Frodo facing his fear in Mordor or Sam facing, you know, the terror of Mordor helps develop their characters in certain ways. It can also drive the plot, obviously. Um, there are certain things that can only happen in Mordor. They can face orcs. They can... Um, you know, that's where, you know, the ring needs to be returned. So there's a lot with the plot that's developed there. The conflict as well, we talk about conflict, but, um, you know, in this case, mortar itself has a lot of elements within the setting that can be barriers or impediments to the characters that they have to overcome. So it's man versus nature. Um, so setting really is very, very important. And it does establish kind of the context for the characters. Um, so it could be the geographical context, it could be the physical context, it could be the historical context. Um, so for example, like the, the example I gave you, um, you know, if there is a, 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 an Arthurian legend of some kind that wants to be told, obviously that needs to be historical in nature and has to connect to, you know, medieval Arthurian legend. The setting has to be correct, you know, has to be in England, it has to be, um, you know, feudal England, it has to have knights and kings and castles and all kinds of things like that. Um, it can also be representative. So it, it can establish the mood or the atmosphere as kind of more of an abstract um, idea. Um, it could also obviously be quite literal. So if you have something like a good sci-fi show, um, I might say, for example, um, if you've ever seen like Studio Ghibli, um, and, and you've seen um, Howl's Moving Castle, you know that the setting of the castle is very important, but it's, it's representing this kind of abstract idea of, of freedom and movement and space outside of, you know, this constriction of the war. Um, and often it can relate to the historical, artistic, economic, or philosophical movements that were taking place around the setting. So um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, for example, uh, Dunkirk, the movie, uh, has you know very specific art historical setting, um, but it can also relate to what was happening at the time, which in this case was you know the war, the the horrors of war, um, uh, kind of the the early modern movement. Um, it, so there's a lot involved. So for example, here what I said is the Wizard of Oz. It, the setting of the Wizard of Oz is is fantasy, right? It's, it's a fantastical land, but it does represent certain um, concerns of the era. So it's really meant to represent the populist movement and the fight over the gold standard um, that was happening at the turn of the century. So setting obviously is super, super important. So as you're analyzing a piece of literature, you wanna think about how does the setting inform these different things? Um, if you look at the point of view, there are four types of point of view. So there's first, second, third person limited on mission, and third person on mission. So I wanted to just kind of quickly run down these. I think you probably are all familiar with this. 
But first person uh, point of view, the narrator uses the word I and the descriptions are from their perspective. So you have full insight into the narrator's um, motivations, their thoughts, their fears, whatever it might be. Um, but you do get limited understanding in that case of other characters' thoughts or motivations. You really only see the one person's perspective. So that can drive you know, conflict, that can drive plot. Um, you can have multiple first-person narrations. So for example, um, if you had switching narrators, which, you know, it, this is not that common in sort of classical literature, but it is more and more common, this uh, multiple narrations um, in, in modern literature. Uh, but you do have to evaluate the reliability of those narrators. So you can have something called an unreliable narrator, which is essentially a person who um, you have no idea if what they're saying really is the truth, but you're only seeing this perspective. Um, you can also have second person narration, which is much less common, but it relies on the pronoun you. So it's really having um, an audience focus instead. So the author is talking to you as the, as the audience, the narrator is talking to you. Um, it's, it's again, very, un, it's not really that common, but it is something that, that can be done. Um, it's more common in say, like modern marketing writing, that kind of thing, where you're talking to your audience's cares and concerns. Um, in classic literature, it's not all that common. Third person lit audition is where the uh, narrator uses those third person pronouns like he or they. So he did this, she did this, they did this. Um, it offers a limited view into say a single character's thoughts or ideas or maybe a couple, but it, you don't get a full understanding of what every single character is thinking or their motivations or what, what they're you know what they're doing um, it's less personal than first person um, uh, point of view or narration and third person omniscient obviously is where you can see the motivation thoughts of all the characters so it says he was terrified she um, worried about this thing uh, you know they they both felt in love with one another whatever it might be um, they, the narrator here can actually convey the kind of their own attitude towards the characters as well. Um, so you might, you know, read a character one way through the narrator and you might read another character another way. So they might be trying to skew your perspective to, to understand that this character is good or this character is bad in the way that they talk about them. Um, it can break the fourth wall as well, which isn't all that common, but it, it can happen as well. So that's kind of as you're analyzing the, the narration and the point of view, these are the things you want to kind of keep in mind. Um, and then as we look at plot, you want to think about plot as more than just what happens in a, in, a, in a story. Think about what's called the narrative arc. This is something you've probably seen. It, it, there's a graphic, but it looks basically just like a little mountain. Um, and it has kind of five parts. And the first part is the exposition. This is where you get the background, the narrator kind of starts the story here. You, what you, you know, if you didn't have this, you wouldn't understand what happens in the story or why certain things are happening. So this is really the background. This is the background of the characters, of the situation, of the historical context. Um, and it kind of helps build the next section, which is the rising action. The rising action is where you start to see conflict. So the conflict could be, you know, uh, an event that happens. It could be um, people kind of coming into conflict one, with one another, but it's where the tension starts to build. Um, and then you start, you dry, that rising action you kind of builds and builds and builds until we get to the climax. This is the most important moment. This is the turning point. This is when everything kind of comes to, comes to a head and starts to get resolved after. So, for example, in Harry Potter, in, say, book seven, this is the final battle of Hogwarts. This is the battle with Harry and Voldemort. This is where Harry goes up against him, you know, and has to defeat him. Um, and then the falling action comes after, and that's where the conflict begins to be resolved. Um, so in this, you know, again, in Harry Potter, that might be after the battle of Hogwarts when they're bearing, you know, all of the dead and, and they're healing everybody else and Harry and Ron Hermione kind of had discussions together about you know I can't believe this happened and what's next and then the resolution is when everything is resolved it's the final sort of 
piece of the story, it's really where, say, the final lesson or moral gets conveyed to the audience. Um, and that's where everything kind of comes back together. Um, there are a number of things that can, can be used to kind of mess with traditional plot structures. And a lot of modern um, authors tend to want to do this because they like to take what is a traditional, like I said, a, a narrative arc or what's called a Freytag's arc um, and, and see how they can interrupt that. So things like foreshadowing and flashbacks can certainly be used to do that. So foreshadowing obviously, as you know, gives you a glimpse into what's to come. Um, flashbacks will give you a, you know, a, a glimpse of what's happened in the past. Um, this is an interesting way that some narrators do this, or some authors do this with their, their narration. That they'll drop you at the beginning of the story into the middle of a situation or a conflict for which you have zero context, and then they'll slowly start to build that understanding through flashbacks. How did the character get to this point? Um, book ending is another way to do this. So you have something that happens at the beginning, and something that happens at the end, and they are um, sort of synced together, or they kind of neatly coalesce the two um, experiences, the beginning and the end, together. You can also have an unresolved narrative. So this is, you know, again, not very common in classic literature, but it is certainly something that's more and more common with modern literature where you have authors who tend to try and mess with these traditional structures. So this could be a narrative where the author really doesn't give you an answer, doesn't tell you the ending, doesn't tell you whether or not the characters were okay or survived. Um, a good example of this might be uh, the ending of The Sopranos, um, where it just goes black and you don't know whether the characters lived or died. Um, you could also, again, like I said, have an unreliable narrator. So the narrator could be telling you the story, but y you have reason to suspect that what's being told is not the truth. Um, you know, and may not may not be, uh, you know, what's actually happening. So psychological thrillers, cr true crime, things like that could really lean into this heavily. And then you could also have dramatic irony where what you think is going to happen at the very end actually doesn't and there's a twist or something like goes wrong um, and you're left with this this um, sort of unexpected event at the end where it's not cleanly and clearly resolved. Um, and then the last thing, I, or the last two things I want to talk about here were conflict and uh, symbolism. So conflict, I've mentioned it a few times, conflict is this idea that you really can't have a story without having some kind of problem or issue for the characters to work at or resolve. Um, it would be a pretty boring story if it was, you know, something like Jill went out, picked some flowers, and she was really happy. Um, so there are four types of universal conflict, and you've probably heard of these. Man versus man, man versus self, man versus nature, man versus society. So I'm going to kind of briefly talk about each one of these, but man versus man focuses on, focuses on a conflict between at least two people. So it, is, it can be more than two, but basically the conflict is happening between these different characters. This can be read really through a critical lens. So it could be, say, a gender, um, an issue between, you know, representing kind of gender dynamics or issues, um, social, socioeconomic, cultural, etc. cetera. Um, for example, come back to Harry Potter. It, one of the central conflicts in Harry Potter is Harry versus Voldemort. Um, that is the central conflict between the two characters. There's no other characters that have that same level of conflict. Um, there's also man versus self. So again, this, this is kind of the inherent struggle within the self. And these, this can be inner conflict with oneself or it could be you know, from outer um, um, factors or forces. So it's the questions like, who am I? You know, how do I fight my demons? What is my place in the world? Um, you know, struggling to overcome, say, something like, like an addiction that might be a character who's man versus self or conflict that's man versus self. And generally these speak to cultural struggles, universal experiences, etc. So things we all understand. Um, uh, as an example here, you know, Batman and his acceptance of, of who he is, acceptance of, you know, becoming the Batman, 
um, if you've seen the the Christopher Nolan versions, then you know that there's a moment where he stands in the cave and he overcomes his fear of the bats and the bats surround him and he basically becomes the Batman. And um, that is an example of man versus self. Man versus nature obviously pits man against the elements. And when I say man, obviously I mean universal man. This could be a woman as well or, or really someone of any gender. Um, it's often a, a harsh environment where the character kind of has to survive or maybe they don't survive. Um, but it generally demonstrates the power of nature over man. Now, sometimes man wins, sometimes man overcomes the conflict. Um, and this can be cultural or historical in nature, can be really important. So um, an example, a couple of examples I've given here, one is Castaway, the movie with Tom Hanks, where he has to survive on a desert island. That's very clearly man versus nature. Um, or if you've ever read To Build a Fire by Jack London, um, that's another story of a man who's simply trying to survive in this harsh wilderness. And nature in this case is not just um, and not just the elements, but it's also, um, you know, the, the natural animals that are present. So another example might be, say, The Revenant, which is not a movie I've seen, but um, I understand that there's a central sort of conflict with, with him and, and a bear, I believe, who attacks him. Um, so something like that would be an example of man versus nature. And then last but not least, man versus society. So this is typically a, a more abstract concept. So it's usually someone or a group of people fighting against systems of oppression. Um, a lot of sci-fi leans heavily into this big brother type of idea. This can be historical, it can be present day, or it can be based in the future. It can be any of these. Um, and it often looks at questions around ethics, laws, social norms, and social codes. Um, and it's focused really on understanding one's place in society or and or challenging that place in society. So a great example of this is The Hunger Games. Um, where you have you know one person who inspires a movement that rises up against an oppressive system of government um, that is a great example of man versus society and last thing I want to talk about here is symbolism so um, symbolism I think you're all probably very familiar with what it is it represents it's it's a, a means of representing ideas movements or ideals so a symbol can be a person, it can be an object, it could be a place, it could be an event, or it could be an action. Um, for example, objects I think are probably the most common and the easiest to understand. Um, I'm trying to think, for example, a certain symbol. Um, if I come back to, say, Harry Potter, um, the Deathly Hallows, uh, you know, can be is a symbol that represents certain three sort of ideas or, or objects. Um, uh, the uh, the elder wand is another symbol of power, right? It's immense power. Um, an action, for example, could be someone like something like the um, uh, the raised fist in a Black Power movement is a symbol of of certain ideals or concepts. Um, and as far as a, a place, I, I'm struggling to think of a, an example, but, um, you know, it could be that a certain place represents, uh, example, Narnia, um, in, in the Chronicles of Narnia, that idea of Narnia is representative of this concept of youth and, and, and freedom and imagination, um, and other, other ideals. So again, this can be complex um, or metaphorical in nature, and it typically evokes emotion or memory or some type of cultural or social meaning. This can also be universal or archetypal. So for example, if I said the wise old man, you all would know what I mean. Um, Obi-Wan Kenobi is an example of an archetypal symbol of the wise old man, um, or the teacher in this case. It can also be conventional. For example, we all know what a skull and crossbones typically represents. That usually means danger or poison or something like that. So um, as you're looking at different texts, you want to think about what are what ideas is the author representing through certain symbols? Because quite often, you're not going to have an author who's going to come out and say, the conflict is this, the symbol represents this. 
um, these are the things that you want to look for when you are analyzing a piece of literature. So go ahead and move on and, um, and let me know if you have any questions.